Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning. That's how I didn't expect that. Wait, good job on that one, right? Hey, we're going to begin by singing the wondrous love of Jesus. And the hymn is called that, Sing the Wondrous Love of Jesus. And regardless of, of life experiences this week or things ahead of you, I love the chorus that simply says, when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory, right? There's comfort in knowing Christ has overcome the world. And when we come to that moment of being before him, we'll know that victory is done. So regardless of what's going on in your life, stand with us and sing with us the wondrous love of Jesus. Sunday morning small, uh, small adult group, Sunday morning adult small group, uh, be back on the 11th of September. Uh, children's uh, Sunday school break is also uh, going to be back on the 11th at 9.30. Uh, regular nursery and children's church service will be, remain the, the same. Uh, handbell choir practice, uh, my wife uh, is uh, the head dingling and she wants a uh, she wants more dinglings. She needs more followers. Um, they have a uh, have a regular thing here from September the seventh at five fifteen to six thirty. She said, "If you can't um, if you can't read music, don't worry. She'll teach you what you need to know." Uh, but they have a uh, they have a really good time. They've got some great instruments and uh, and they they put on a good performance. But uh, so anyway, uh, uh, call or text Sandra at uh, the phone number there and uh, get involved in that. Uh, communion potluck uh, on Sundays, uh, the last Sunday of the month, uh, communion and church family potluck after the service. Everyone is welcome to stick around after service for good food and fellowship. And it'll be next Sunday on the 28th. Is that next Sunday, June, the Christmas? 
Uh, for those planning on bringing a dish, the sign-up sheet can be found in the lobby, and there's also an added column there for folks to help uh, with the organization and putting out the dishes and all that kind of stuff. Uh, great way to fellowship life groups, uh, grow in your faith, uh, meet on, uh, my group meets on Thursdays, uh, be starting again September the 8th. Uh, we're going to host uh, in our home. Oh my gosh, we just moved and we got boxes everywhere. Jiminy Christmas. All right. Uh, and the Wolves uh, host in their home in Atwater. Uh, sign up sheets are available in the lobby. Um, it's really a good time to get together and get to know people on a more intimate level and, and, uh, and uh, kind of have a support group, if you will. But uh, it's really, really a good group of people. Um, also, finally here, there's a flyer out here about an underground prayer workshop um, be held across the street at Evergreen Christian Center on the 23rd from 6.30 to 8. So pick up one of these flyers and... Um, find out more about that. Um, it just, again, brings to mind, like with the Hunsucks, about um, how widespread um, the Lord needs to be in the world. And, um, and the time is short, and the uh, fields are uh, ready to be harvested, and we need to be out there making sure that people know uh, what the truth is, and, um, and we're the ones that got to do it. So... Everybody pick a project and, uh, and get on it. So let's pray. Father, thanks for today, just for this church, um, just for the people that are here. Uh, what, a, what a special group of people. Um, that we, we care about each other, and, and, uh, and we want to see the numbers grow, not for growth's sake, but just because people need you. And, uh, and as I said, we're the ones to do it. And, uh, so like the Hunsucks, just, uh, just give us the, uh, the opportunity, give us the, uh, the timing. We ask you to bless their ministry, the Hunsucks ministry in uh, India. Uh, just make it fruitful and multiply it. Uh, raise up the people to go and, uh, and minister to those folks in uh, Punjab and the, and the, the Sikhs, um, even here in uh, Livingston. Um, just bless us today. Protect our pastor. Uh, make, give him wisdom and uh, insight, and uh, just thank you for who you are. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. As we continue in worship this morning, we're going to sing a couple of songs here about um, this wonderful truth of who we have in Christ. Um, you know, closer than a friend. What a friend we have in Jesus, right? That and no matter where we go, what we do, we know that he holds us firmly in his hand. And there's, there's countless reasons for the believer to, to worship and to celebrate and to give thanks for their creator to God. And yet sometimes we see the, the difficulties and the struggles ahead of us, and yet Nathan has wonderfully reminded us of what prayer does, right? Prayer in a situation brings us back to the possibilities of, of again, who God is, that he hears, and that we have this wonderful advocate um, named Jesus. And so I, I encourage you as we continue to worship, if you can't find a reason to worship God today, uh, be very mindful of who Christ is. Think on him and what God has done for us in him. And as we, as we just sing together and worship him, as we sing 10,000 reasons, stand with us and let's sing together. Your song. 
song again Whatever may pass And whatever lies before me Let me be singing when the evening comes Bless the Lord, oh my soul
our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. And oh, what peace we often trouble anywhere we should never be discouraged take it to the Lord in prayer can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share our every weakness take it to the Lord in prayer and are we weak and heavy laden cumbered with a load of care precious Savior still our rest to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou will find a soulless there. Blessed Savior, Thou hast promised, Thou wilt all our burdens bear. May we ever, Lord, be bringing all to Thee in earnest prayer. Soon remain standing for the reading of God's word. This morning I'll be reading from Psalm 85. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to grab them. Turn to Psalm 85. If you do not have a Bible, there's a pew Bible you can grab and follow along. It's good to do that so you know I'm not making any of this up. Right? <laughs> Psalm 85, and the psalmist <clears throat> says this, O Lord, you showed favor to your land. You restored the captivity of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. You withdrew all your fury. You turned away from your burning anger. Restore us, O God of our salvation, and cause your indignation towards us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not yourself 
revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you. Show us your loving kindness, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will say, for he will speak peace to his people, to his godly ones. But let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Loving kindness and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth springs from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. Indeed, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its produce. Righteousness will go before him and will make his footsteps into a way. The Lord bless the reading of his word. You may be seated this morning. And as we continue in an attitude of worship and praise, if you would bow your heads, your hearts, your lives with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this wonderful privilege that we can bow our lives and come before you. We acknowledge, Lord, that it is not of our own work or might or strength or good deeds, but it is of Christ who has made a way for us. We acknowledge this moment, Lord, in this time, this day, that you are God. You are the one who restores us. You are the one who forgives us. You are the one who has covered all our sin in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Father, you are full of grace and mercy and patience. Your loving kindness, Lord, we know is eternal. Your mercy is infinite. Your holiness, Lord, transcends everything. It is your holiness, Lord, your perfection, your majesty that shows us, Lord, our need for Jesus. Lord, we are, and we acknowledge our sin, we are in need of one who could pay a price for us that we could never. So, Lord, we are. We praise you, just like the psalmist, looking for the one to come who will make a way. So we praise you for Calvary. We praise you for the cross. We praise you for our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Calvary shows us, Lord, that you take sin very seriously. Your holiness demands it. And so we come, even though we have been redeemed and declared righteous because of Christ, we still struggle in this body against remaining sin. So we take time, Lord, as your church, as your sons and daughters, As we come before you, we take time to confess, Lord, the the sins that have easily entangled us. And whether that be in the form of thoughts that are contrary to your word or words that have come out of our mouth because our heart has been hard, maybe actions or deeds that were done, Lord, we ask that you would have mercy upon us, that you would forgive us for wanting our own way. You would forgive us, Lord, for our pride and our selfishness. Lord, often we look to justify our actions. So, Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit would reveal the hidden sins or justified sins, that we would see them right, that we would see them for what they are. They are sins against you, for all our sin is against you. And we confess them now, Lord, and we ask that you would forgive us to turn and repent of them. We pray just like the psalmist, Lord, restore us. We acknowledge that you are, you are God. You are the God of our salvation. So Lord, lead us. Lead us to look upon sin seriously, that we would have godly sorrow. And lead us to repentance, not for the sake of sorrow, not for, not for the sake of remorse, but Lord, genuine repentance, acknowledging our sin is against you, that you would revive us once again. You would show your, your loving kindness to us. Lord, we cannot thank you enough for what Christ has done. We can't thank you enough, Lord, that he is truly our good shepherd. And we pray and ask, God, that you would continue to open our ears, that we would hear his voice through your word leading us. Lord, we thank you for the opportunities which you set in front of each and every one of us, the good works that you've placed, Lord, in front of us to do, that we might do them with the right motivation to glorify you, Lord, to love you. 
And Father, we know that, that you listen, you hear the, the prayers of your people. We know, Lord, that when we pray your purpose, your will, you are listening. And so, God, we come and pray, Lord, that you would awaken your church. We ask, God, that there would be a, an awakening to the gospel, that the gospel would bring about, Lord, a godly sorrow that would lead to repentance and obedience to the truths of your scripture or the truths of your word. Pray that our hearts would be open, that they'd be soft, that we would have ears to hear, and Lord, a desire to be obedient. I pray for us this morning, at Faith Community Bible Church, that we would have, as the psalmist says, a, a, a fear, a reverence of who you are. Lord, the psalmist says that salvation is near those who have a fear, a reverence of you. Lord, so, Father, lead us to reverence you, lead us to love you, lead us to have that right fear and relationship with you. I pray, Lord, for our ministries to be consumed with a passion and a desire to make you known that we would see, Lord, in our own lives an awakening and a revival, that we would see through even this little uh, community, this uh, church here, uh, an awakening in our community, an impact into our community. But I pray that we would be your sons and daughters, your church with a voice to see the nation turn. We pray over, Lord, those who serve in our communities. We ask for safety. We pray against the unrest that we see. We pray against the wickedness that we see happening, Lord, from uh, our government and the federal and the state. Lord, we pray for righteousness. We pray for leaders who are full of justice, who will do what is right. I pray for us this morning, Lord, those who might be going through a difficult situation or a difficult time. We pray for those in need of physical healing. That today, Lord, would be something they would experience by you. I pray for those who are struggling, or maybe it's financial, that you would meet those needs in just a mighty way, that it would grow a testimony and a praise to who you are and how you provide. And I pray for those this morning, Lord, who might be just going through a, a dry spiritual time. Lord, rain down your grace and your mercy upon those. Let us once again have eyes that are open to see you, fixed upon Christ. Let us realize that he's overcome the world. Let us realize he stands with us through the fires and the, and the trials of life. Let us realize he's closer than a brother, closer than a friend. Let us realize that you are the ever-present, omnipresent God. I pray, Lord, that we would know that today. I pray, Lord, over marriages and families that they would be growing, uh, Lord, reconciling, strengthened. We pray for outreach, Lord, in us. Lord, let us, each and every one of us, take seriously our lives and how we live them, that we would demonstrate you and speak of you. And everywhere we go, let us have a right reverence and fear of you and not man. Lead us that way. Lord, we also want to take time, Lord, this morning. We pray over the offering. Those prepared to give, we ask, God, that it would be an act of, of worship, acknowledging all that we are, all that we have is by your grace, by your goodness. Let us, Lord, the heart of worship and charity give. And we thank you for that. And Lord, may the offering be used for the furtherance, Lord, of, of your kingdom and the proclamation of your gospel. And to that end, we pray all of this in the mighty and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, as we continue in worship this morning, I'd like to dismiss the children to Children's Church. And as always, the rest of us who are young at heart, right? But it's a little too old for Children's Church. If you would turn in your Bibles, please, to 2 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 7. And Lord willing, we will finish chapter 7 this morning. I always like to say that just in case I just go along. We have to come back next week, right? I want to leave that option out there for me. Uh, but in case, yeah. <laughs> uh, but we're going to look at the remaining verses, the second part of verse 13 through the end of 16. And if you recall last week, we talked about uh, this moment where Titus has returned, right? Titus has returned to Paul with information regarding the Corinthians, and, and Paul is excited. Uh, there has been godly sorrow, right? And, and he's not excited because they're sorrowful. And he tells them, I'm not excited that you're, you're sorrowful for the sake of being sorry, but that this, by the will of God, has led you to repentance, right? We, we hear that word today. A lot of churches are like, stay away from that word. That's a bad word. But yet Paul is thrilled. He praises God that there has been repentance in this church, right? This is a good thing. And so we see, right, the, the outworking of what does godly sorrow in us, what, what, what happens in our lives when 
we take the Bible seriously, right? It's kind of a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous book, doesn't it? Because it changes your life. Uh, James is, he doesn't hold back his punches. Our, our men on Saturday morning have been working through James, and, and James says, look, you can't say you have faith if it's dead, right? He says, no, you have a living faith, and a living faith does something, right? It, it's a direction of our life, and so we see in Christianity, there's an evidence of Christians, right? There's something that we bear. We bear fruit, right? There is a change in direction. There's a change in life, and so Paul is, in essence, witnessing this. There's this group of Christians, and if you've been with us from the beginning of this, you know we've covered some ground, right? You remember back in the first letter, there were these divisions. You remember that group? There's the, I follow Paul, because he's the guy. And there's the, I follow Apollos, because he's a little bit better than your guy. And then there's Cephas. Yeah, he started, the, yeah, he's even better than all y'all. And then there was the, that holier-than-thou group, right? We follow Jesus, right? Oh, my goodness. So there's all these divisions and all these things we've gone through, but Paul has come to this moment where there has been genuine repentance. We'll say it like that. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. And now there's, there's an obedience developing. Why? Because there's evidence. There's a change of direction, right? This is what happens in the Christian life. And I think for us this morning, you know, we may look at that and say, well, you know, well, that's all good and dandy. I, you know, my life is fine. It's good. But, but you know, Paul is, is not satisfied. He's going he's gonna to move on from chapter 7. He's going to start talking about things they still have to deal with, right? He knows they're not perfect, but he's going to move forward with them. I think a lot of times in life, we just feel like, oh, man, what's the point? I can't do it, right? You're, you're now calling for obedience. But I, I'm going to tell you, obedience is not uncharacteristic, of what it means to be a Christian. That's like the story of the little girl who's gone to Sunday school class one Sunday, and, and the, the message, their Sunday school class, was uh, on the Sermon on the Mount, specifically chapter 5, verse 16, of what it means to let your light so shine. And so she was just consumed with this as they talked about it, and she went home and told her mother, Mother, how do I, in a practical way, how do I, how do I be a light that shines? And so her mother responds and says, well, you, know, you do very simple things when you're obedient and you're thoughtful and caring. You're, you know, you're showing that Christ is at work in you. So she's thrilled with this and she begins to just conduct her life and live her life this way. So much so that the following Sunday when they come back to their Sunday school class, she's starting to brag to some of the other girls in the class that she's doing such a good job. And of course, others felt that they were doing a little better. And this leads to an altercation of sorts, where mom is now called to the Sunday school class, and look what has happened. Mom asks the daughter, okay, what happened? Weren't we supposed to be a light that shines? Her daughter responds and says, mom, I've blown that thing out. <laughs> I think sometimes in life, when we go through situations, when we hear scripture call, to obedience, we just say, you know what? My light's been blown out. I'm good enough. Paul is, is looking upon this godly sorrow. He is seeing the blessings, the blessings of obedience. And sometimes we think wrongly about it. So this is what he says. This is in chapter 7, the second part of verse 13. 13 begins, I'll just read it, for this reason... We have been comforted, and then, and besides our comfort, we rejoiced even much more for the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For if in anything I have boasted to him about you, I was not put to shame, but as we spoke all things to you in truth, so also our boasting before Titus proved to be the truth. His affection abounds all the more toward you as he remembers the obedience of you all. How you received him with fear and trembling. And Paul in verse 16 says, I rejoice that in everything I have confidence in you. Let me offer a brief prayer as we look at this passage. Lord, uh, we ask now that you would uh, instruct us. We pray that your spirit would be here teaching us. The blessings, Lord, that we see in uh, obedience, how you call us. And Lord, we know that as your spirit is with us, Lord, there will be a change. There will be a direction of our lives. But let us even beyond that, Lord, see the goodness 
uh, the good things that come, Lord, from being obedient. And Lord, as always, get me out of the way that we would receive what you have for us this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul, last Sunday, as we looked at these verses, the verses uh, 8 through 13, the first part of 13, Paul has talked about this godly sorrow, and we saw that there is blessings, right, of godly sorrow. Godly sorrow has brought them to a place where they have now treating this, this sin seriously, right? We're going to call sin, sin, and we're going to repent of it. That's a very good thing, right? They're not casual about it. And because they do this, by necessity, what will happen in your life? Well, you're going to draw closer to God, right? That's just the default thing that happens. And out of this, we saw that there is a hunger in verse 11. There's a hunger for holiness. And that this infects, is that the right word? Affects is probably, infects might be the right word too. It should infect us, right? Or it affects the whole church. When there is one who takes their faith seriously and you begin to see life change, well, you begin to see, you know, want to be the, uh, a little bit serious about it too. It's uh, what they call the, this is not true, I'm just making this up. But it is the Gretzky effect, right? The Wayne Gretzky effect. Uh, some of you are old enough to remember Wayne Gretzky, or maybe if you're hockey players or not, but uh, I remember when my oldest brother, when he was going to USC, would go and watch the hockey games, and the Kings, and they were horrible, right? And then they, they brought on Wayne Gretzky, and all of a sudden, these average players played a lot better. Some of you remember that? I was, I'm just slow on my age, didn't I? Okay. Well, it's like that, I think, sometimes in our spiritual walk. If you're excited about your faith, you have this possibility to ignite others. And this is what we see. And so Paul says, look, there is good things from godly sorrow. It produces something. And Paul's going to, he's talking about their obedience through this passage. There is a response to what God has done to this letter that Paul has said has, has been very hurtful. I, I at first was really sorry about it, but I'm not sorry about it because it's led to something good. And now there's obedience in the church. So for us as Faith Community Bible Church, what are we to learn and grab hold of this? Well, there's blessings from obedience. And my first one is the second part of verse 13, where I say obedience identifies God's people. I mean, Paul sees them as a different group of individuals now. He says in this verse, and besides our comfort, we rejoice even much more for the joy of Titus because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. Right? Titus is encouraged. His spirit has been refreshed. Paul is excited. No doubt, Paul is rejoicing as he's told us in this passage. I mean, Paul looks upon comfort here coming from the community of believers. Right? There is something that he is encouraged about. See, the body of Christ is not to be a place where we come and, and we have our anxieties grow ever more so. Right? We don't want to see that. It should be a place where we have joy. Or we have encouragement, right? It shouldn't be coming to church and it produce heartache. Now, that was probably happening there for a while, but now Paul says, man, there are good things happening. Obedience is a good thing. Godly sorrow to repentance is a good thing. Paul doesn't regret this letter that's led to this. So he pens it, right? He writes the hard things. Sometimes in life, we have to hear hard things. I wonder if, as he communicates, tells us, he said all these things to Titus, and I wonder if Titus really knew everything that was in that letter, right? Does he really understand there's some highly flammable material in this letter that's just going to catch fire, right? Because they are going to go one of two ways. It seems that there's no hesitancy, but we see a great rejoice on the backside of it. Huh? You almost get that feeling of like, well, I don't know. I don't know how these people are going to respond, I mean, Paul is uncertain. I mean, he believes God has planted this church, but, he, but you know, he's not certain about these professing believers. They profess Christ, but we'll see. So Titus goes, right? I mean, Titus is stepping into this, this moment of op apostolic delegate, right? He's representing Paul. He steps into this situation, and he learns that these professing believers are, in fact, really believers, there's godly sorrow. I mean, Titus experiences Christian love. He experiences, right, there's sorrow over their sin. He experiences this pursuit of, of holiness. He experiences the humility they have for God, a reverence for God, a reverence for his word. This is what he experiences. This is what refreshes him. I mean, you kind of get the idea that Titus didn't have to work too hard about it. Right, maybe that's the fear and trembling. They were already ready, man. Oh, my goodness, here it comes. 
But Paul says the whole church was this way. Right? The, Paul begins to understand the community this way. Right? Once they were marked as this bunch of groups of, of different segregation and different divisions and different issues, and now they're identified this way. That's the point. Obedience marks them differently. Why is that? Obedience is not natural, is it? You think about the child whose parent says, uh, you know, Johnny, I need you to sit down in the chair, and that child looks upon a mom or dad and says, okay, I'll sit down in this chair, but that heart is still standing. And some of you know that. You're like, oh, yeah, I remember that child. <laughs> or you're going, oh, yeah, how's that child, right? <laughs> we understand that. It's not a natural thing. It just takes the Spirit of God. It takes the work of God, but it begins to identify who you are. Uh, this is fruit of the Spirit working itself out. Remember, Paul is not concerned that, hey, you're sorrowful. I'm, I don't mean to, to bring you to a point of remorse. My desire is I bring you to a point of repentance, that you would realize right, your sin is against the Holy God. That cannot be fabricated. It identifies God's people. See, a believer desires to be obedient. They're not perfect. It's not easy. Right? Sometimes we have to put right, uh, our, our flesh in submission. Sometimes we've got to bring both barrels of the Word of God, if you will, right to that situation. Sometimes we just, man, we need brothers and sisters to hold me accountable. Sometimes we have to work through those things. But a Christian, right, who loves Christ begins to love the things that Christ loves. That's what you see happening. That's what's happening in this church. A Christian loves the commands that Christ gives. Doesn't mean they're easy, but we begin to love them. A Christian begins to love the church that Jesus spilt blood for. There are others that Christ has redeemed. We begin to love these things. Now, I realize, right, some of us are tough to love. I get that. Some of us are hard to love. Some of us are those, you're that, that, the EGRs. That's an EGR. I had a friend who would say that. They're EGR. Extra grace required, right? <laughs> Don't worry. That person's an EGR. Just be patient. Give them extra grace. I realize that. Sometimes it's difficult. It doesn't mean it's going to be perfect, but it means this is a direction. The, the Corinthians aren't automatically fixed. But they're ready to hear, aren't they? God is stirring their hearts. They're, they're beginning to be identified different than divisions. Now it's, I, mean, I, I love Christ. I, I love God. Their hearts have been softened. See, Paul knows he's sending Titus probably into a battlefield of sorts. He's not 100% sure. He's trusting the Spirit of God to do something. And they can go one of two ways, right? They can hear this word, Titus, who do you think you are? We don't have any followers of Titus. The heart can grow hard. They could reject it. Or it could be humbled. It could be repent. Let's say the same is for you and I. When we hear God's word. You're going to go one of two ways. You can divvy off of that a bunch, but ultimately your heart is going to hear God's word. Or it's going to reject it. And see, both ways are, are identifiable. We know what a person, right, who, who is humble to God's word, they, they look different. And we know a person whose heart is hard and won't listen to God's word. We know you by this. Even a child is known by his doings. Not just a child. Even. That's the same for us. And I think the challenge for us is to realize does this identify me? Paul isn't asking for perfection. The Corinthians aren't automatically perfect. But where is your heart? Is your heart humbled? Or is it hard? Will you hear the word of God? Will it bring you to repentance? Will it bring you to godly sorrow? Or are you saying, you know what, that's for someone else? See, this is the church. It identifies who they are. I remember the, the biographer, Peter Evans, who wrote about Peter Sellers. If you like him, some of the uh, Peter Sellers movies, he, was, he had so many different characters, and he got so engrossed in so many different characters, he, he didn't know who he was half the time, so to speak, right? And a fan came up to Peter Sellers one time and asked him, are you Peter Sellers? And his response was, not today. <laughs> you know, sometimes we'll treat obedience this way. Well, no, well not today. 
there is a direction, right, that we'll see in our lives. It identifies God's people. It doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. Sometimes we feel like that little girl, I just blown the light out. Not only is my light not shining, I blew that thing out. And what do we do in those moments? We tend to go, well, forget it. Or we say, you know what? God will forgive me. I'll just keep doing it. Both are wrong. Paul says there is an identifying marker about this people. They are not perfect, but they're changed. So it identifies us, right? Obedience identifies God's people. There's, an, there's a fruit at work from the Spirit. There's a, a humbleness towards His Word, right? So we see it identifies us. And it goes on to verse 14 where I say obedience is expected. Right, of God's people. Look what Paul is saying in verse 14. For if in anything, I remember he's writing to these Corinthian church, he says, I've boasted to Titus, that's to him, about you. Right, so Paul, even uns- unsure about how this thing is going to play out, is telling Titus, I wonder if he's just having to encourage him. Right, it's going to be a war zone, don't worry. Right, they're actually pretty good. And they'll, they'll bite you, but you'll live. Right, I wonder if that's some of the, of the conversation. But he says, I've boasted to him about you, and I was not put to shame, but as we spoke all things to you in truth, Paul's covering the ground, right? I spoke this to you guys. I've covered this with the church. I'm getting Titus up to speed here, so also I, our boasting before Titus proved to be the truth, right? So Paul covered all the ground, and so what is Paul, what is Paul banking on here? He's banking that Titus, one day he will see him again, right? This church isn't going to just, you know, chew him up and spit him out. But he believes that God's people, when God's spirit is there, if there's evidence of God's spirit, there's going to be obedience, there's going to be repentance, there's going to be, right? Or he has, rather, an expectation that he's going to be, that Titus is going to be received. If, if obedience identifies God's people, then we can expect it from other people people who are God's people. That's his point. See, if we have God's spirit, then we're all going, at least we should be all be going the same direction. We all should be in this, right? We're all in this together. We all bear the cross. We all pick it up. We all follow after the Savior Jesus. Again, identity, right? But we expect this identity in others. Paul expects this of the spirit of God to work through this hurtful letter he's putting in Titus's hand. Again, I wonder if he's like, oh, right? Titus, I hope to see you again. You know, I don't know. He's sending send you on your way. Well, Paul has a trust in the Spirit of God, right? When God's Word is preached, and the Spirit has something to, to use, something to work with, well, then we see faith, right? We see belief. It comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. There's something. Paul is trusting. There's an expectation that obedience will happen because, right, the word is proclaimed. Now, Paul has told him this before in chapter 1 of this letter, verse 14. He says, just as you also partially did understand us, that we are your reason to be proud as you also are ours, right? He's, he's proud of them. He's boasting in them. He's boasting to Titus. And now regardless of the relationship he has with them, this relationship that's, that's struggling, right, because there's some issues with them and Paul, he's sharing everything. He's sharing his joy. He's boasting about this church and he's telling Titus, right, I, I expect them to receive you. I expect them to be... Uh, uh, to hear the words, right? To have a heart that is soft. I mean, Paul, think about it. Theologically, he understands what the Spirit should be doing if the Spirit is there. Galatians 5, 22 through 25. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law, right? And he goes on, he says, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus... Right? If we have believers there, if you belong to Christ Jesus, they've crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And then he says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. But you see a parallel here. To live by the Spirit means salvation. The Spirit is dwelling in us. We have crucified the flesh. How do we do that? The Spirit of God. And if the Spirit of God is dwelling in us, then we're going to walk by the Spirit. There's identity. And so if I have this identity, I'm going to expect this from other people who profess Christ. Here's Paul's expectation. 
He's expecting God's worst to, or excuse me, God's spirit to produce obedience. Now we might say that's a bold step, right? That's pretty bold of you. It could have went one or two ways here, Paul. It's pretty bold, but he has confidence in, in of course, the word communicated. He has confidence in the fact that Christ has planted this church. He has confidence that God will move when the word is preached. He expects it. Now, we might say he's expecting a little too much of the Corinthians. I don't think so. I think in, in American Christianity, we don't expect this hardly at all. I think we let people say they prayed a prayer once, okay, you're good, and have a life that's completely contrary. I think we should expect this. Again, it's not perfection. Paul, Paul doesn't think the Corinthians are automatically perfect. But there is a change in them. And this expectation is saying, look, I expect if God's spirit to be in your life, I expect there to be a change. It might be minor, it might be small, but there is change and there is direction. There, there is a working of the, of the Spirit and sanctification. There is a humbleness to God's Word. There's a willingness to say, Lord, forgive me, a sinner. Have mercy upon me. See, God's Spirit can bring about that kind of change. Sometimes we, we treat this in the church as like, hey, if you just show up on a Sunday, that's good, right? And for some of us, that's where we're at, right? Amen. Reminds me of the little boy who was standing in the classroom who's eye to eye and toe to toe with his teacher and there's all these math problems on the board behind him unfinished and he says to his teacher, I'm not an underachiever. You're an over expector. Right? <laughs> there has to be an expectation of sorts. I mean, Paul ends this, this chapter for us. Of course, for him, the letter carries on. But for us, it ends with what? Confidence. How can Paul have confidence? Man, the Spirit of God. There is an idea. There is an expectation. So Jesus quoted Isaiah 29, 13 and Matthew 15, 7 through 8 when he's addressing the Pharisees, these religious leaders. And he says, you hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you. This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts is far away from me. See, a follower of Jesus Christ is not going to separate their obedience from profession. That's the reality. There is a faith that is not dead, that is living. There's a direction, right, of their life. It doesn't mean perfection. My point is a bold point here. I'm simply stating that one who professes Christ but has no obedience whatsoever to Christ does not know Christ. I mean, Jesus is clear in Matthew 7. Turn with me, if you will, to uh, Hebrews chapter 3. So you can see in your own Bible the parallel. Chapter 3, I'm going to read verses 12 through 19. And my Bible has at the head of this pericope the peril of unbelief. But listen to how the Hebrew writer reasons. He says, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But, a contrast, encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, right? Community, encourage, right? Accountability. So that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. He says, for, here's his reason, we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. A life that's firm of, full of assurance is a life full of repentance, right? Obedience. And then his, his example, right? While it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. And he explains this, for who provoked him? When they had heard, indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? 
Was it not with those who sinned, whose body fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? Listen to his conclusion, verse 19. So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. It's unbelief that is the parallel to not obeying. I mean, I, I guess we could tweak that around and tell you something that might encourage you, but that's the reality of it. That's the reasoning of it. This is the expectation of Paul to this church. There's going to be things happening in them. The Spirit is going to produce. Those who believe have a direction. Now, no doubt, Paul was encouraged uh, when Titus returned. He was relieved to hear the testimony. But there's something happening again within them, and he's encouraged by this. This is Paul's expectation when he sends Titus and he is relieved. This is what the Spirit of God is doing. It does something. He expects the Spirit to produce this. Isn't it amazing today in American Christianity, this is the one thing most churches will flee from. Don't tell someone they're sinning. They already know they're, 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 they already know they're bad. You realize that Jesus began his earthly ministry by saying, repent. Maybe Jesus is wrong. I don't know. But see, there's the expectation. It doesn't mean you're perfect. It means you take seriously the word of God. Your heart is to say, Lord, how do I, how do I love you? How do I follow after you? Because that is a blessing. You're growing closer to God. And listen, it goes on to the next, verse 15. Obedience is foundational to, to loving God. Here's the response. He says, uh, Titus's affection abounds all the more toward you as you remember the obedience of you. As he thinks about this, as he thinks about how you received him, right? How you received him with fear and trembling. I mean, here is a reliable measure of us loving God is our obedience, right? If we do not have obedience, we're not really loving God. We may dress the part, we may act the part, we may talk the part, but none of these things prove we love him. You can say it all you want, but I believe you, if you, you'll have action towards this love, right? Obedience is the only way. Again, it's not something natural, right? We trust the Spirit of God as His Word is preached. We naturally love self. We don't naturally like correcting ourselves. Paul told Titus, you know, as we think about who Titus is, and Titus is reflecting with, with affection, and, and it abounds, right, of what they're doing. I mean, uh, Paul wrote to Titus in Titus 1, 4 through 5, when he left Titus uh, in Crete. I mean, Titus has traveled with Paul, and, and Paul has used him in wonderful ways, and he leaves him in Crete, and he says this in Titus chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. He says, to Titus, my true child. Right? And there, many scholars believe Paul led Titus to Christ. He says, my, my true child is in the common faith. Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Well, that's the commission there, right? In Crete, well, definitely. In Corinth, he's doing the same thing. And, and Titus has taken this letter, and he's gone to them to set things in order. And so we see a little bit about Titus's heart. What is he excited about? And guess what? They received me with fear and trembling, fear and reverence. That's a good thing. And he's sitting there going, man, I, I'm thinking about this wonderful experience. That doesn't sound like the same group of people that Paul's been writing to, does it? I mean, he has affection for them. It's a, you know, what he experienced is a great compassion. And it's growing. It's abounding in him. I mean, Titus goes, right, and he, he experiences these great things. I mean, this shows really his love in Paul, of course, Paul's love for the church. To them, right, repentance is precious, Man, they've gained brothers and sisters, the impact of reconciliation. They're like, man, this is good. And there's also anxiety over rejection. Now think about it for us. If I was to ask you this question, when was the last time you sat back and you thought about someone uh, that, that your affection grew and it abounded more and more? Would it be someone in the church? Most likely not. We would probably use that language for personal relationships, right? A spouse, children, grandchildren. We may think upon them. Why? 
Well, they're precious because of the relationship. I know them. I've laughed with them. I've cried with them. I've prayed with them. That's usually our reaction, right? We go through life and we say, oh, you know, this is, I am close to them. It's like the, the little boy who's kind of estranged from his family a little bit. Him and another child were talking about, you know, who has moved the most. One child says, my family has moved for three times in three different states. The other child says, that's nothing. My family has moved five times, and every single time I still found them. <laughs> right? We love some, some people in our family. We're just like, you know, it'd be okay if uncle so-and-so or aunt so-and-so didn't make it this year to the Thanksgiving dinner. We understand that. But when you think about this, they love the church. They love these brothers and sisters, right? But let me ask you this question. Can you tell others you genuinely love them if there's not action that backs that up? I mean, can we really say we love someone and deny that love with our actions? No. Should our actions back up? Hey, spouse, I love you, and here's my actions. Some of you are probably thinking, I'm going to nudge my spouse right now. You need better actions, right? Let's see, our relationship is the same. And this is the blessing of obedience. And when we're obedient, God is pleased. God is, in, God is excited. God is encouraged, right? I mean, Jesus tells us in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commands, right? If love, loving God is keeping, right? He, John 3, 36, when he has this conversation with Nicodemus, uh, he who believes the Son has eternal life, belief, yes. And he says, he contrasts that with those who don't obey, right? Belief means to obey, to love means to keep. I mean, this is the relationship we have with God. The blessings of obedience aren't just simply, well, I got to go to church and, and I got to do these things. No, we're, we're worshiping a living God. He's, he's the one who's created us. Obedience is foundational to loving him. Think about it. When we come together on a Sunday, what brings us together? What joy unites us? Is it not our love for God first and foremost? And how do we love him? Well, you're doing it right now. We've assembled on his day, right? We've come to hear his words. We want to hear his commands. We want to love his church. I'm going to tell you, church, I love being with you, and I know as your pastor you have to love me. That's the confidence I have. <laughs> we enjoy each other. This is his heart, right? His love for the church is a love for God. God is doing something in my brothers and sisters in Corinth. And as he thinks about the, the reception, they received him with fear and trembling. Now, that could be they're just scared. Paul's going to say some things, right? But fear and trembling in Scripture describes the human reaction to God's power. See, God is working on that side as well. Their hearts are ready to hear. Paul says in Philippians 2, 12 through 13, So then, my beloved... Just as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but how much more in my absence. Work out your salvation with what? Fear and trembling. Why? For it's God who's at work in you. Both to will and to work to his good pleasure. See, that's the change. Here's the, here's the fear and trembling. Here's the reverence. Titus has come. He's given us Paul's instruction. They've humbled themselves. They've, they've grown a deep concern for Titus and Paul both. There's a reverence for God. There's a, a fear of God. As we just said in our scripture reading, right, brings us close to the salvation of God, right? They love God. Their obedience is not just proof. It's not just expected. It's, it's the wonderful confidence that every believer has that when I'm obedient, God is pleased. Thomas Brooks said, every man obeys Christ as he prizes Christ, and no otherwise. Because we love Christ because he first loved us, and we follow after him. We know we're pleasing and loving God. And lastly, here this morning, obedience positions God's people for ministry. 
<clears throat> Paul says in verse 16, I rejoice that in everything I have confidence in you. That's, that's different language, right? From Paul. It's seasoned throughout, but he has a different confidence in them. Paul is, has said in the, in the first letter, right? He has told them that he's been, uh, that God is faithful and that God has called them into fellowship with Jesus Christ. And, and now Paul's confidence here is that, man, they are in fellowship with Christ. It's almost like a full circle moment from the first letter to now. They are in partnership with Christ. They have a close fellowship, right? The Corinthians have repented. There's evidence of truth. The business of God now has become their business. I mean, the, the, the fellowship, the growing, right? They've, they've come to, to see that we have believed on God. Anytime that, that we come and we assemble, I mean, we're saying with our lives, Lord, I, I believe your word to be true. I want to implement it in my life. I believe your, your commands are good. Your precepts are good. I'll spend my time differently. I trust, I love you, God. That's what's happening, right? Our, our decisions in life are changed. Let's pray about this. Let's take a moment, you might say, regarding this decision. Let's pray about this. And I guarantee you, as you grow closer to the Lord and the Lord is working in you, your prayers begin to end with, Lord, I desire this, but I desire more your will and not my own. See, a church that's positioned like this, is ready to hear God's word, his commands. This is what Paul knows about the Corinthians. I mean, we're, we're just finishing chapter 7. He's got some ground to cover, but what is he a confident? Where is his confidence in? They now have ears to hear. They're positioned for ministry. There's still things as they, remember Christianity is brand new to them. They have come steeped out of a pagan culture. They're still working these things out. Some of the things that we may say, that's really, I don't know why they struggle with that. It's brand new to them. And Paul has some ground to cover, but he knows this church now is positioned. They're ready to hear the commands. They're ready to take up the offering, which is going to go into the next chapter. See, confidence means to be bold. Paul now has the freedom because there has been repentance, because there's godly sorrow, because now there's obedience. He has the freedom to speak to them, to reprove or admonish or advise. Why? Because they'll hear it. Paul's confidence is not just simply in, in the people. It's, again, the work of God's Spirit. They will hear. Right? For us as a New Testament church, what is our heart? What is our heart? the Great Commission. Lord, we want to we see others come to know you. And those who come to know you, we want to teach all that you have commanded. That's our drive. That's who we are. And a church that is obedient is ready to do those things. It's about being faithful, right, in every area of our lives. There was a story told about John Huss when he was arrested and he was told he was going to be burned to death. That it said that he practiced holding his hand over the fire to prepare himself. And the reason was that it, he wanted to be faithful to the very end. So obedience is this wonderful blessing in our lives. I mean, not only do we see it identifies us as God's people, we, we see it in the community of believers. I can expect it in my brothers and sisters to hold me accountable because we both understand that we're picking up this cross and following this awesome, wonderful Savior. I know that my obedience, the blessing of it is to know that I am pleasing to God doesn't mean I'm perfect, but there's this direction. God is at work in me. I have a, a, a reverence and a fear and trembling and knowing God is working his purpose in me. And when God is working this purpose, he has positioned me. Not to simply live on this planet, make an earning, and, and then eventually uh, go to heaven when I die or he comes back, but to, to be a light that shines. Sometimes we act like that little girl. I just blown it out. Maybe we've blown it out and we fail to see the purpose. What Christ calls us. Paul is thrilled. It's a bunch of brothers and sisters. 
where God has worked his will, his purpose, and it's evidenced in this godly sorrow that has led them to repentance that now has produced good fruit. Produces wonderful fruit in a church that says, you know, I will be faithful to the very end. And Lord, if you call me to give my life over the flames, then let me be prepared for that as well. Church, here in a moment, we're gonna, I'm going to close in prayer, but I just want to encourage you and ask you this question. Where is your heart today? Has God softened your heart? Are you humble to his word? Is there a direction in your life? All these things aren't, aren't answered or fixed in the Corinthian church because all of a sudden, you know, Titus had a good experience and there was repentance. There's work to be done every day. But our, our, our testimony to God and our love for God is not simply on the Lord's day we assemble, but on Monday morning when we're in the workplace. We have a light that shines. We speak and live and not blow that light out. On Tuesday, when we're uh, doing our, our things, our chores, and our duties, are we having a light that shines? Are we being obedient? And when those days come where we just say, you know what, it's blown out. Some of us get used to having it blown out. We need to repent with godly sorrow, acknowledging all our sin is against God. Get that light burning again and keep moving forward. We're going to close by singing uh, this song. It's called Christ is All. And I just want to read you the, the first verse here. It says, I found a treasure that can't be taken. I found a well that won't run dry. A worldly pleasures now forsaken. Behold, what love, what life is mine. The chorus says, Christ is all, Christ is all, and my song will ever be. Christ is all, all in all. My song will ever be. Christ is all. See, that's our heart. That's our desire. And when that's in front of us, obedience is a blessing. We get to follow. We get to live. We get to be pleasing to our Lord and Savior because His Spirit is at work in us. Let's pray. Father, we do thank You for, again, this time. And I pray, Lord, that today as this, this message might be one that we might simply overlook or think we're, we're good or can't or whatever the, the excuse we might conjure up, but I pray by your Spirit you would stir our hearts. Lord, we know that we are not perfect. Calvary shows us that. But it doesn't mean, Father, that we simply just go through the motions. You've called us to be obedient because... Lord, you desire to work a good work in us. You desire that we be a light that shines, that we would represent you. And I know times, Lord, we, we do a, a, a fair job at that. At times, we do a horrible job at that. But Lord, I, I pray for us today that the, the seeds of, of this word, Lord, would not fall on hard ground, but our hearts would be soft. I pray that the evil one would not take this away, but that we would see the blessings of what it means to open your word and go to our secret place, as Jesus says, and pray in secret and commune with you that way, that it's not a waste of time. And in those moments of, of decision, that we would cry out to you first, and Lord, that we would trust upon uh, your word and what it says, that we would begin to look upon this world with spiritual eyes, upon our lives that way that we would look upon the areas where maybe we have justified sin, that your spirit, again, would make it us aware that we would turn and follow, and that our following after you would not be uh, following with a hard heart, a one of rebellion that simply says, okay, I'll sit down, but my heart is still standing, the one that is soft, one that says, Lord, you are my creator, and you have purchased me back by the blood of Jesus, and I get to, I get to follow after you. Let us not lose sight of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I pray that you would, you would encourage every soul here this morning with these words. This is not meant to, to, to tear us down, but to build us up, to keep going. 
So Lord, lead us that way. Let our heart be that way. And let us, Father, realize what we have in Jesus. That as we sing this song, we would thank you that Christ is all, that I have Christ, and forevermore I will have Christ. That I will know, Lord, that this day that you will love me because of Christ and you will eternally love me because of Christ. Let us have that confidence. Let, it, let, let this song be our anthem as we live for you. We thank you, Lord. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we sing that song, I just want to uh, mention that if you have questions regarding the message or salvation, what it means to follow Christ, I would love to help you or answer any questions that I can. Uh, questions about even, even Scripture or other areas. I would love to do that. If you want someone to pray with you, I'd love to pray with you. Um, I'll be up here after the service. And if you have questions with what Nathan shared earlier, he'll be in the back. Please uh, run by there and talk to him as well. But let's, as we close our service this morning, let's stand together. Let's sing Christ is all. treasure that can't be taken I found a well that won't run dry a worldly pleasure being now forsaken behold my love what life is mine Endless striving now make me righteous. Could all my works now grant me hope? Oh, hallelujah! The blood of Jesus, my only plea, my only hope. Christ is all. song will ever be. 
Christ is all and all in all, and my song will ever be Christ is all, and my song will ever be Christ is all. All God's people said. Amen. Lord bless you and keep you going. It's great.